Hey, what's up? How's it going? So I've got this code from the Programmer's Brain book. This is example code from early on in the book of an example of something that is difficult for the human mind to process because of bad naming and certain things like that in the code. So all this code right here, from here to there, this is all their code verbatim out of the book, I believe. And then there was a return statement down here that's not needed, so I removed it and I went ahead and initialized this end variable right here to 19 so that it doesn't run on an infinite loop on QBasic. So I'm just gonna, what this code's supposed to do, just so you know, is it's supposed to convert an integer number into its uh, binary representation, a binary string. Okay, I'm gonna run it and the, it's down there at the bottom of the screen right between uh, QBasic and press any key to continue, you can see there's nothing, it's just blank. So no output there, understandable. And I believe that problem, let me space this a little bit to make it a little more easier to read as the first step. And then the next step is this smell right here. Even if uh, QBasic could interpret this for loop structure thing like this, which for the most part, it's syntactically correct but uh i suppose not semantically so this step zero is kind of odd i'm just assuming that the original author wrote this maybe in some version of old version of apple basic or something to where maybe there's not a while construct and this is like the little clever hack to get a similar effect or something i don't know but all i do know is that this doesn't work properly in qbasic which was the basic on PCs with DOS from like the mid 80s through the early 90s and even beyond arguably. Um, you know, and so it's just a code smell in general, regardless of which dialect of basic it's written in. So that's the first thing I notice. And then the next thing is all these N1s and N2s and, you know, basically like little two character variable names. Um, if there's a dollar sign in basic, that means it is a, that dollar sign is arguably a, a letter of the identifier. So this is like a BS effectively or a B dollar sign, but it also serves the purpose of identifying it as a string type as opposed to an integer or something else, right? So if I were to just have a variable named B without that, that would be a separate variable than the B dollar sign for the record, just a little uh, detail, basic programming detail, not anything to sweat over. Okay, so if we come down here one more time through, um, we get back to this for loop, I'm gonna go ahead and get rid of that and make it a while loop. Seems much more appropriate. And I'm gonna say while, originally that was testing both the um, the N2 and it was also creating, and a, uh, sorry, I don't have an undo, but it was creating a n1 variable it said for n1 equals n2 two zero step zero so that two zero lets us know that as long we, we, we want to do this until we get zero so while n is greater than zero and i'm just going to use n because up here we can see n2 is just a glorified n with some corrections applied to it so we never use n again looking through this code, so I'm just going to make that n right there. It's just going to overwrite itself since we're not using the old value of n, and then we don't have to track, you know, maybe a half dozen versions of n or something that are undescriptive. And this let b string, effectively, that's how I always read that, like I was saying, b string equal an empty string. QBasic automatically does that. If we were to just you know, all of a sudden invoke this B string like this, it would automatically evaluate to an empty string. We can even come down here and do that. And oh, expected variable equals expression. Okay, so it in the uh, the REPL shell, it won't allow us to do that, but you'll see up here, it effectively will. Okay, so we change that to a while loop. So that means we need to change this. That's normally the termination point or the uh, cycle point for the for loop will make it cycle loop for a while loop by making it an, a while end statement, a wind. And going back through it again, it's saying let n2 equal n1. 
So since n1 effectively was just initialized to this absolute value of n right here, um, and like I said, we're never using n again, n1 is really just n. So let's just do that. And as long as we're not assigning to it, right? And we are right here, which is fine because it is our loop variable. So we're making it equal to n2. Not messing up the original algorithm, just trimming it up. These are things, I consider this a way to make it more readable, like at scale as well. So even though this is a simple, relatively simple loop in the basic programming language, this could represent a super complex loop in you know, Java or Python or something else, C++, whatever. Okay, and then it's printing the B string. Let's go ahead and run it and see what happens. All right, it looks like we're actually down there in that same area. We're getting the 10011. I guess I could pop my mouse out here. Um, right there. That is the binary value for 19. So that's a 1 plus a 2 is a 3. And that's a what? 2 to the 0, 2 to the 1, 2 to the 3, 2 to the 4, 2 to the 5. Is that what it is? I can't even remember binary numbers. Okay, shouldn't be 2 to the 5. That number seems like it would be too big. 2 to the power of the function. Hmm. All right. Anyway, if we come back down here, this N2, if we step through it, and let's talk about like exactly what it's doing, and never mind the fact that I can't even do binary math anymore. Um, so this is just sanitizing the input. We have it hard-coded in 19. It's coming down here, making sure it's an absolute value. Um, so no, it's always positive effectively. It's an integral value. So if we give it a decimal value, um, it will otherwise try and round a decimal value. So, but I'll just go ahead and move on for the moment. Um, while n is greater than zero, which we can see up here, it's 19. So that's true. Let, we can get rid of all these lets. They're all optional. They're just cruft in QBasic. So we might as well get rid of them so that it's less syntax to read. So this n2 equals the integral value of n divided by 2. So it's equal to half of n. And then we come down here and we can see we're using it right there. And then we're assigning it back to n right there. OK, well, let's make it a little more descriptive. Let's rename it to half. And then down here, we'll name it to half again. All right. And then, of course, we need to change it here. Definitely use search and replace if there's anything more involved in that okay so now we it reads a little bit better hopefully this int n divided by 2 equals half we're going to take half times 2 so 19 divided by 2 would be 9.5 that int is going to effectively floor it so we're going to end up with 9 and then right here it's going to be 9 times 2 is 18 and then n is still 19 so 19 minus 18 is going to be 1 and then we're going to prepend that one onto our existing binary string, which is just an empty string. We didn't have to initialize it. That's case in point I was telling you about. And then we come down here and we effectively decrement n by half. And then we come back up here. So that first iteration would have left us with that one in the far right column. We're looping around. n is now equal to half of itself floored. So nine then we're going to get half a nine four five floor that we're going to get a four come in here four times two is eight nine minus eight is one so we'll have another one a one one starting from the right hand side and then we're going to decrement n by half again come up and loop so it was nine half a nine four five floor becomes four four divided by two is two so half is 2, n is 4, 2 times 2 is 4, 4 minus 4 is 0, prepend. So we now have an 0, 1, 1 effectively on our built up string. Half n again, which is going to be uh, 2. Come up here, plug in the 2. We get um, half of the 2 is going to be 2 divided by 2 equals 1. 1 times 2 is 2, 2 minus 2 is 0, prepend that, so we have 0, 0, 1, 1 on our, for our string now. 
decrement by half, come up and loop, um, and is now one, right? If I'm still on track, one divided by two is 0 0.5, floor to an integer should be zero. Um, zero times two is zero. One, are we on one yet? Hmm. I lost track of how to do the math of where we're at, which is good because I was worried actually that I was going to get all the way through that. And the whole point is, is that it's that difficult to get through it where I lost track of a number in my head and I'm like, oh, wow, where am I at? I literally need to start this loop over now and go through all that in my mind to rebuild up my cognitive plate to put that last little like potato chip on or whatever. And that sucks, right? So how can I, now that I've got it broke down, at least we can step through it and we can, you know, discern that the logic appears to be right. But to step through the whole thing and graphs the whole thing, now we either have to put a comment there or we have to push it out into a well-named function. Since I'm trying to avoid comments because they get out of sync and things like that, they're not conducive to test-driven development as much because it's not an isolated function. We're just going to go ahead and move everything out to a function. And then if, you know, at scale in a large program, if the program slows down too much because of a few function calls or something, then those can be in line. But you know, get it working first properly, right? Then measure, then tune. Okay, so I'm going to, first of all, push this stuff out into a function. So I'll cut that. I should be cutting it after I set up the function, but I'm just, whatever. It's a little bit quicker like this. So function, and that stuff is, uh, that's the hard-coded number. So instead, we're going to go ahead and get a number from user but make it a well-named and properly spelled function that actually describes like almost as a comment would you know what it's going to do and then in basic just like with that string you can also append a percentage symbol which implies or specifies that you're going to return an integral value so that's just some syntactical stuff to know about there not a big deal Okay, so I'm going to come in here and paste that stuff that I cut out, which was this guy. I'm only doing two spaces. Let me... I don't think I can... Oh, I can. I can tab and shift tab. Let me see if I highlight them both. Tab. Oh, nice. I didn't realize I could do that. Okay, but I'm trying to stick to two spaces right now to keep it consistent. Okay, so ends hard-coded to 19. We don't want that. What we want is we want to call the input keyword, pass it the prompt of enter a number, and then we want to store whatever they number, or excuse me, whatever they enter into n. And then we're going, we can go ahead and bring in down here, make sure that it's, um, you know, floored to an integral value, non-negative, and then store it back in itself. Or you know what, right here we'll actually just say get number from user percent. So what we're doing is we're saving that over the name of the function itself, and that's how you return a value from a function. So let's go back to the main program and let's call that. That's get number from user percent sign, and we need to store that in something. So it looks like we're the way the program just stay consistent we're storing that in end. let's see if it still works okay so down at the bottom of the screen down there you can see it's asking me for a number i'm going to put in 19 and bam it still is giving me the same result what i'm going to do two now is i'm going to add a cls up here and what that does is that clears the screen it just makes it a little easier so when we run it we can just go 19 like that and have a nice clean canvas to work with okay back in action okay so now that's a little bit more it's saying get number from user. So, you know, of course that was hard coded, so that doesn't spell out a whole lot to us, but at least it does tell us what it's doing. So down here, this while loop that we'd have to read through and, you know, oh yeah, what was that? What was that loop doing? And then we have to go through, do all the math. Okay, maybe halfway through we figure out it looks, yeah, it's creating a binary string or whatever. But anyway, let's cut that out, put it in another function. Function called uh, convert to binary and that's going to return a string 
it could return a number, but it just makes more sense. And most programming language standard libraries and stuff tend to return a string for it. It could be an integral value in the sense if it was like one zero one zero one zero or whatever. But if you have like that OX at the beginning or something like that, obviously you couldn't just use a pure integral value. And plus, since this is a string, is it is once more removed from being an integer and less likely to be used as one when it, you know, a decimal integer when we wouldn't want it to be. Okay, anyway, so now I'm going to paste all that logic back in here. Now I know I can highlight this and just tab it over. Who cares if it's a little too far? It's we can't see the other code from here. Um, while n is greater than zero, we know this logic's all pretty right. I'm just going through it one more time, see if I can make it a little more readable. This b string, it's like, yeah, we do know that this is our binary string effectively because we're just now fresh in the code. But if we came back a week or 10 later, we might not know. So even something like bin might be a little bit more suggestive. Um, but it, we could just put binary or binary string or whatever we want, you know. But with QBasic, you're hard limited to the what 79 columns or whatever so and back then a lot of people shortcutted the name so I'll just go ahead and do bin string since a lot of people who wrote QBasic a uh, competent programmer should read that s as a string that dollar sign okay it's doing all that that and one other thing I did here one of the times when I was practicing this was I converted this to the word decimal which reminds me I need to bring in a parameter here decimal and we'll make sure that that's an integer or actually let's see if we can get away with it not by putting that percent sign it specifies specifically that it's supposed to be an integer but we can also leave it off so I have decimal there everywhere I have it in I'm replacing with the word decimal which reminds me this is the the original base 10 value this is not a binary value And so right here we can see decimal equals half. So that could even be, you know, if we really wanted to get more descriptive at the trade-off of having more corrupt, we could say that that's like half decimal or something, make it more readable. Okay, looking through that, I'm going to go ahead and run it and see if we're running okay. Oh, no output. So let's jump back over to the main function. And we can see we're not calling anything. So we need to call it with n. So I'm going to say convert to binary, and then we're going to pass it in. And we're basically, we're going to print the result of that. We don't need this one anymore. Still nothing. Print, convert to binary. Okay, so what I did was I forgot to put that dollar sign here, which is a big gotcha, especially in QBasic. It doesn't seem to lint over those symbols. But so that dollar sign is effectively just any other character in the name as well as in, as specifying the type it has like a dual purpose. So obviously convert, I could have a function called convert to binary with no dollar sign and it would be its own function. Anyway, here we go, 19, still nothing. Convert to binary, get number from user. I'm checking the spelling and the... Uh, symbols on those I'm going to look here convert to binary get number from user it looked the same to me so let's go in here input get a number um, get number from user equals that value enter a number okay going back here let's go to this one Convert to binary, we're taking a number called decimal. Well, decimal is greater than zero. Decimal two. Da, 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 da. Okay, there's never any point here where I assign. I need to come down here and do is go uh, convert to binary string equals bin string. So all that buildup and processing we're doing on this bin string on here, we need to go ahead and dump that into this value because that's the return value effectively. So this should work.
All right, we got it back working again. Okay, so now if I go back to this, since this is our highest level of abstraction in our program right here, effectively our main, but uh, anyway, it's it's our highest level of abstraction. Of abstraction, those methods or those functions are um, they're doing that low level, more low level specialized work, right? So up here is where we actually have some plain English. Is this get number from user and convert to binary string? So what we can obviously do is combine this all into one line of code. Like this. So convert to binary, get number from user, print. A little out of order, but for the most part says what it's doing. Let's see if it works. Still working. Okay, and the reason, I don't know if I mentioned it, but the reason I'm using 19 is because these, uh, this 1-1 one, one over here on this side, if you do other numbers, it can be difficult to tell certain things about it. But since there's a 1-1 one, one on the right-hand side, if for some reason we were processing it backwards and there was a 1-1 one, one over here and an 0-1 over here, that'd be like a dead giveaway that something was wrong. Um, and also the number's greater than 16, so it's helping, you know, beyond four binary digits, which is like basically at eight binary digits, or excuse me, eight bits, 16 bits, different points like that are good. It's kind of like testing um, negative one, zero, positive one. But anyway, this one's just above the value 16, so it's just above a four bit value. Not one above, but several above a four bit value. Okay, anyway, not something to dwell on too hard, but just to give some reasoning behind that. So right here we're printing all that, but if we read it, print convert to binary, get number from user. So what if we just rename this to number from user, and then it said convert to binary, number from user. That to me reads better. So since I haven't published this interface, um, I'm going to go ahead and do that. It's a shorter name. It's a little bit less action oriented, but I feel like it reads better in the code and it lets us know where the number ultimately came from anyway. So a bit more, that's probably the one exception where I would use a noun instead of a verb, in that type of a scenario. But I'm definitely open for feedback on that. So one more time back to the main function. So we have print, convert to binary string, number from user. Run it, let's do a different one like nine. Nine didn't work. What did I do wrong? What did I just change? Okay, number from user right here should be doing the search and replace instead of, and I will remember to save this. Okay. Let's do 19. All right, cool. It's all working. So anyway, that's that. That's what I was basically wanting to get at. It automatically adds these declarations up here for the function calls whenever you save. So that whole program became one line effectively, right? We, we hid 99% of the low level details besides like the fact this is a string and this is an integer, which hopefully those only serve to help clarify and not clutter our code by leaving those there. And then in here, we went ahead and replaced n with decimal, which actually describes what it is. n2 with half, also describing. It's a shorter word, um, but it's also in a very small context. So that's one of our excuses we can get away with by saying only half here is it's like, ah, oh, it's literally within three lines of code, right? Um, if it was much more than that, we might wanna be, have a longer, they say the name, when you're on the fence, the name should fit the scope as far as the length and detail of it. Yeah, and then we're assigning that back. If we wanted to, we could use convert to binary as the string value here and build it up but I feel like bin's shorter and sweeter and a little bit more to the point, maybe. And then finally, we'll go take one more look at number from user, getting the user input, storing it into n, and 
doing all the sanitization, which this could represent other function calls, which it does in this case, obviously, but you know, more and more function calls, all sorts of stuff. That line could unpack to like a paragraph worth of code or something, right, in a bigger program. And the same thing with this, this could be calling out to some other module to deal with user input through a dialogue or something. So anyway, sorry to be all long-winded about it. That is uh, how, in general, I think that, you know, doing refactoring out to some little functions and making things well-named can really help the program read and put things at the right abstraction level from where you're working at. Thanks for watching.